is actually the question of entanglement, speaking about it both in terms of scientific terms or what is this parallel or equivalent in spiritual term is not an easy thing, not a simple thing. Both of them are sort of esoteric in their own fields. But basically, the, I'll give you a little idea about entanglement. The film gave you some. Einstein was, so might be the first to actually write a paper about it. That quantum theory indicates that there is this phenomena that, he, that later Schrodinger called entanglement, which is that two particles that started from some kind of interaction become entangled, which means when they are very far away from each other, if they are entangled, if something happens to one of them, instantaneously something happens to the other, as if they are in instantaneous communication. And Einstein brought it up not because he thought that was a wonderful thing, but he thought that's a problem and must be it is the problem that's going to help him to disprove that quantum theory was not correct. He didn't like quantum theory. He was not comfortable with it. He thought it can't be true. Reality depends on probability. As he said, God doesn't throw ice or uh, doesn't throw dice. That was his, his view about entanglement. I mean, about the quantum theory. But anyway, later on, somebody like Bell developed the theorem about entanglement, which was to be tested experimentally, which an experimental test showed that entanglement in, physics, in the quantum theory is true. It's experimentally verifiable. It's not only theoretically predictable by quantum theory, which is the dominant theory about small particles, not only predictive, but also experimentally verifiable. So by now it's been shown that Einstein didn't uh, understand it and his hope for it was misplaced at least. That's how most scientists now view it. An interesting thing, it took a long time before uh, science verified the truth of entanglement. And um, interesting thing that uh, one of the things they found out, the entanglement, first of all, that Einstein talked about, which much of the studies were about, are two particles, pair of particles far away in space. They behave as if they know what's happening to each other instantaneously. And Einstein didn't believe that's possible because he said they have to communicate and the speed of light is the fastest they can go. This is faster than the speed of light, it must be not true. Quantum theory must be at least incomplete. Later on, they've not only been just verified experimentally that uh, entanglement, which means two particles interact uh, behave separately, even regardless of how far, it can be billions of light years away or very close by, they behave as if they know what the other one is doing if they are entangled. I'm not going to get into the physics of it much, I don't know it much myself. Others will, will do it, Manas will do that, and others will be speaking about that in detail. But I want to get into how does it relate to spirituality? What is it about spiritual experience or experience of conscious awareness that relates to entanglement because it's the farthest away from what spiritual people really experience. But then I read, I think recently happened, that it has been shown that entanglement happens not only in space but also in time. That means Two particles can be entangled, know what each other is doing when they are not in the same time, which means when there is a time distance between them. It's called duration. Like they're not existing at the same time, at a different time, one like yesterday, one today, but they behave as if 
they knew what each other is doing. And I thought, mm, that's, that's very interesting. I started to pique my interest because that sounds like something I know from experience, not from experiment. And then I thought the thing that made me realize, oh, there's something here that is useful for my understanding of the spiritual nature of the world or of reality. And when they discovered the, in physics that entangled particles, uh, they found out, have wormholes between them. Like they were able to create a pair of tiny wormholes and, and tiny uh, black holes that they found out when they were entangled, they found out there is a wormhole between them. Wormhole is something that actually Einstein uh, theory predicted and he knew about, which is that wormhole in time and space means when you're going, the wormhole means you don't need to travel to the, get to the other place. You don't need to go to the future to travel to the future. You step in and you're right there. Just like if you watch TV, like Jump Gate, they call it, or all kind of names in, in, in sci-fi. It's like, uh, uh, they call it wormhole, which I think is a leading misnomer because it doesn't look like a worm, wormhole is a winding kind of thing. It's actually a hole, uh, it's a spatial hole. But the true wormhole means a hole in time and space. That means it's not constituted by time and space. It is a, a, a kind of a window where time and space don't exist. That's what makes uh, it interesting. That made it very interesting to me. And I started saying, well, okay, no, because I have an experience of black of wormholes. That when you have, when you understand consciousness or spiritual nature, sometimes you have an experience that sometimes I can't call but a wormhole. And so pieces were falling together for me and said, okay, now I'm seeing something. I wasn't feeling, I was discovering the true basis of the quantum phenomena of entanglement. I didn't think that, I still don't think that. I said, well, the entanglement, the idea of entanglement and the discovery of entanglement seems to be parallel, very similar and very inspiring and point to a way of experiencing spiritual nature that is sort of uh, rare and obscure, but it is very, very interesting. And I was maybe it has something to do with quantum entanglement and which made me wonder, does the spiritual experience I know about does have to do with this entanglement that Einstein predicted? I still don't know because not, I used to be sort of in physics, but I'm not in physics anymore, and my math is too rusty to try to figure it out. So, but I'll tell you a story of why I've, I see a connection, or at least let's call it a parallel. I usually, in my work as a spiritual teacher, I use scientific discoveries and ideas more as metaphors that point to something that's experienceable by consciousness and vice versa. That thing that happened in the spiritual universe might be inspiring to, for uh, scientific discoveries. So let's see, let me just tell you the story of how it saw the possible connection. That's what is important, not necessarily just for physicists who might be intrigued by that, but for us human beings how we can be entangled in a way that is really beautiful. Not the entanglement that people think about emotionally entangled and mixed up and stuff, but entangled in a way that makes us really appreciate and love each other much more than we imagined possible. It started the story some years ago when I was in a condition that people called the realized condition of the state of unity, 
or non-duality. And uh, one thing to know about spiritual experience is that it is, a spiritual experience is, is an attempt or reference to finding out what is the nature of things. Just like in physics, what is the nature of things? Uh, the physics go to elementary particles, and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And in, in spiritual work is what is the nature of experience? And you get to more and more elementary and more uh, primordial and more fundamental, you know, thing about it to find out what is that. And when you find that, you find it that it is not physical, it's not emotional. It's not mental, it's something else, so they call it spiritual. Some people call it consciousness, some people call it awareness, some people call it love. Right? Some people just call it spirit. You know? um, so depending on which teaching, which tradition, how the spiritual dimensions referred to changes, not everybody calls it consciousness. Sufis, for instance, the, the, the Muslim mystics call it the divine essence. You know, Christian mysticism will, will talk about God the Father. They won't talk about is it consciousness, awareness. No, no. The true spirit is much beyond that. God, through the true spirit created consciousness and awareness. So anyway, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just trying to say something about spirituality. That it's not one thing. Every spiritual teaching has its uh, view of it. Similar to the way cosmology is these days. There's so many theories about the universe. It's becoming like there are so many theories and none of them are proven. So they're all possible. And maybe they're all true. Who knows? I think that all the spiritual teachings are all true. I happen to think that way. They're all true and exact and accurate. And everybody who follows them, if you really follow them, you might find freedom and fulfillment and happiness and all that. And uh, so, so I want in that condition that some call it spiritual uh, realization, which is the most classic uh, mystical experience which is that of unity or oneness. Unity, the Sufis talk about unity and oneness. Unity meaning the spiritual nature or the, the beingness of the universe, the beingness that can be experienced through the consciousness directly, through the awareness, is an indivisible, uh, undividable, uh, field or continuum or a medium that is self-conscious, sensitive, has a sensitivity all throughout it and is self-aware and self-knowing, although it expresses its knowing through individual consciousnesses like human beings and other beings. So in this mystical experience, the Sufis talk about it, unity to mean its indivisibility. And they talk about oneness. Oneness means for them that this unity encompasses all that we see, all that we experience, all the universe, all outer and inner universe, all experiences and all perception, all that is perceived and experienced, and all are basically the topography that this unity, this uh, pure being appears to, the, to us, appears as the world and as our experiences of the world. Usually in a very uh, smart spiritual people, they question themselves, they ask the question just the way physicists do. Is this my experience of the world reality or is it really reality? How do I know it is reality if it's just my experience? See? Spiritual traditions have that and it has to be reconfirmed by another person, by oneself and other people until you can, because it is of the nature of spiritual experience, mystical experience, you experience it, there is some certainty. This is true. This is really true. This is the truth. 
But as the Sufi saying said, when I said this is true, I didn't mean this only, this is, this only is the truth. I meant this too is true. So anyway, this is a little bit of background of spiritual experience. Uh, but in the realization I was experiencing, I'm experiencing myself as this vast, uh, boundless kind of sense of being, sense of consciousness, uh, awareness, light, that seems in, to me to that consciousness that it underlies all the universe, all my thoughts and feeling, but all the objects that I perceive, that it is really not only underlies, it is the very nature of them. Just like elementary particles are sort of the natures of matter, this is uh, the, the spiritual nature is, is like going at it at a different angle and seeing this is its fundamental nature that is uh, beyond any theory. It is just uh, what you perceive directly, if you perceive without preconception and without, the without theories, without any opinions. And so the experience in this place is that this, this vastness and freedom, at the same time this vastness theorem that is always the nature of everything, that is always manifesting everything. It's the nature of the body, the nature of the atom, it's the nature of the electron, it's the nature of the strings, it's the nature of the mountains, it's the nature of the galaxies, it's the nature of the parallel universes. Wherever you go, you find this nature. You can't escape from it. That's what it means. It is the true nature, the spiritual true nature. When they say spiritual true nature, that's how it is, how it is meant. It's the nature of our thoughts, nature of our body, nature of any level of that we can observe, uh, conceptualize, or experience. One thing that I noticed that brought it close to this idea of entanglement, many people think, well, this is a state of unity and oneness, so everything is connected. All, there's no division, there's no separateness between one form and another. There's no separation between me and you. So of course, the particles are connected through this medium that make them entangled. That for me didn't make, do it. Because it doesn't really explain entanglement. It explains that there is a relationship between them. They are connected somehow. It doesn't explain how they interact instantaneously. Because spiritual experience does not contradict usually physical laws. Physical laws still apply. See? But one thing I noticed here had to do with the question of time. I don't even know when I started, so I know I have how much in a... So anyway... Um, and this experience of, of presence, or presence of consciousness, the sense of it is that the presence now is not in the past, not in the future, it is now. But when you, when I, and I really explore what does it mean that it is now, I realize that the now is not the present moment of time, the now is the presence itself, is the beingness itself, is the consciousness itself. Is the, is the being or the truth of the spiritual nature itself is now. And that's, a, oh wow, that is now. Then what does it mean about the now of yesterday? What does it mean about the now of tomorrow? I had a feeling there's only one being, it's unity. And this beingness is independent of time. Time doesn't pass on it, time passes in it, within it. It, is, it observes time, but not, it doesn't, time doesn't pass on it. Similar to light and physics. Light, time doesn't light, uh, uh, pass on and light. You might have heard that. Light is always young, is always 
uh, never ages. The same thing about the true spirit. It doesn't age, it is always now. And this now of now is the same now of yesterday, the same now of ten, seven billion years ago. That means somehow this nowness includes all of times, but I can see how that is because it is just now. There is, I didn't see past, I didn't see future, but I, understood, I, I realize it is the now of all time, so it must have all of time. How does it have all time? I didn't see that. I couldn't see it until the nowness itself, the nowness of being, the self-conscious presence began to explore itself and began to see that it is not just a fullness of presence, of abundance and the nature of everything, but it has a sense of openness, a spaciousness to it which revealed that it has a kind of emptiness to it. It is full and empty at the same time. You see, it is uh, a richness, but a spaciousness like empty space. It has, and which makes us feel psychologically quite open. Maurizio says, Hamid is really open. It's not me that's open. It's through nature is open. You see. Anyone who's experiencing through nature has have to be open. You see. Otherwise, they're not experiencing through nature. They're not experiencing being. So anyway, that was the beginning of recognizing something about entanglement, which is beginning to see that there is what I call emptiness, which is the openness of consciousness, that it is open in the sense it is spacious, there is nothing there. At the same time, this is the nature of everything. It's like the space is sort of the inside of matter. To give it a metaphor that might help us to understand. It's like space is the inside of matter here. The emptiness is the inside of the beingness, of the consciousness, of the light. And then at some point I realized this emptiness can appear in different ways, the different subtleties to it. And one stage of subtlety, this nothing in the spaciousness, had a quantum leap. It jumped from spaciousness to no space. I felt like this emptiness suddenly, which is the inseparable, property of the consciousness of true being and nature of everything, that it's inseparable from it, is the property of total non-being. It's like space is erased and everything is erased with it. There's something completely nothing. And this completely nothing is also inseparable from the nature of everything. The nature of everything, we call it consciousness, awareness, or spirit, is also at the same time completely non-existent. Non-existent in the sense it doesn't exist the way we think of things existing physically. It's more like feeling, it's, it's, it's all this I'm talking about experience. No, I'm not talking about experiment, I'm not talking about opinion. The experience is like, I am here, but at the same time, there's nobody here. There's actually nothing here. When I look for myself, I don't find it. When I look for the consciousness, there's nothing to be found. And that fact of its unfindability is what makes it so open to everything. What makes it be the most brilliant light. Because there is total transparency in it. The fact that it's completely absent of anything that constitutes it, makes it completely 100% transparent. But that transparency, what I saw in it, the feeling of it, I was feeling it some, one of the ways I experienced it one time, I was feeling some kind of tightness in my lower body, you know, in my sacrum. It's like as if my body was trying to, take a smaller place. I said, 
what's that? Why, what's this tension? When I explode, I realized because in my mind, I was still thinking that my body takes space. And I was experiencing something that is beyond space. So my body couldn't take space. And when I felt that quality, which is not space, the body relaxed. And as it relaxed, it began to become transparent, just like everything else. But what that showed me is that this nature that is everywhere, what's called non-dual experience, the experience of unity or oneness, is that consciousness is everywhere. It is the nature of everything. It is omnipresent. So it is the presence that is everywhere, that unifies everything, where nothing can be separate because the nature is like the medium that carves itself into what we call the world, what we call the universe, what we call experience. Taking you on a journey, sort of. I don't want to just spring it on you suddenly. Step by step, at least. It's not a little thing to understand. It took me years. <laughs> um, also, to know and to be quite an intrepid explorer still took me many years. Then, the first hint is recognizing that in this nature of consciousness or this nature of beingness, although it is vast and, and it's everywhere, it is, has no extension, has no spatial extension, that the spatial extension is apparent. I can see it, but when I feel, I don't feel this extension. Like I look at you, you're over there, but I feel you're here. I look at everything. In this realization, which is deeper realization of the unity, you had to get to the, the kind of emptiness of consciousness to understand this kind of unity. It is not the unity like everything manifesting over the same medium, over the same continuum, like, like waves in the ocean. No, everything is unified here because because there's no spatial distance there's no spatial distance between one form or another there's no spatial distance between one particle or another what does that mean does that mean the whole universe collapses to a point it feels that way Sometimes feels the whole universe is one point. That's one thing the Sagadara Maharaj said. You see, that one point of light is the whole universe. So anyway, the experience of it is a kind of unity which is not the classical kind of unity, classical mystical kind of unity. Classical mystical unity is that God or consciousness or spirit is a medium that is infinite and eternal and it's everywhere and it's the nature of everything and it is show us the unity and inseparability of everything. Here, it is a kind, I have the minute left, really? Well. <laughs> okay, I'll try. We close. Here, the recognition, the experience, it's a spiritual experience of realization, is that I, at this point, at this particular body, I contain all bodies. All bodies appear outside of me, they are all within me. The whole universe, when I look at it, I could see the magnificent, vast, infinite universe, but the realization, realize that there's no distance between one thing or another. They're all here and unified in a, some kind of unimaginable intimacy. In spiritual literature, it is called the truth interpenetration. That each 
form interpenetrate other forms. This glass interpenetrates this thing. That means they coexist physically. And physically, they don't. They can't do that. In the spiritual sense, we see the spiritual forms, they're interpenetrate. They can go through each other. But here in this perception, is that we see even the physical world, we see the physical world as interpenetrated. In a sense, there is a direct experience that all the form, physical, mental, emotional, they're all residing in one place that is not a spot in space because there's no space. But then, the next thing we realize, just like Einstein said, space and time are inseparable. It's a space-time. Space time, space and time are dimensional, the same thing. In this kind of spiritual experience, I realize that not only all space is here, but all time is here. That my childhood is right now. My death is right now. They are here. I might not be able to see them, but they're right here according to this fundamental truth, property of consciousness or property of spirit. Because everybody says the spiritual nature consciousness is beyond time and space. And that is the easy part to see. The difficult part, the more esoteric, the rare part is to see it's not only beyond time, it contains all time and space and it reveals the nature of time and space. We don't understand time and space until we understand it from the perspective of consciousness. We don't just go beyond it. That's the easy, the beginning of realization. The next step is to get into time and space and see what is their nature. And you realize that all time and space is a unity that all time and space is sort of a visual illusion. It doesn't mean it's created by somebody. The apartness is a kind of an illusion, but in reality, all t space is here, all time is here. But the way Chinese say it is a phenomenal form they call she. And the formlessness, through Nehi, they're called Sheh uh, and uh, I forgot the word. Li. Li. Huh? Li. It's called Li. They say each Sheh is all of Li. That means each form, this physical body, this glass, contains all of being. And then the next step, each Sheh contains all shares. This glass contains the whole universe in it. And it is possible to experience directly. And when I saw that, I said, well, that's interesting. That's sort of similar to what entanglement is saying. Because if it is true, there is no distance between entangled particles in space or in time, according to the spiritual property of consciousness. There's no distance. So it seems it could explain entanglement in the sense it's similar, it's parallel to it. It is entanglement in the spiritual level, but entanglement on the spiritual level is what you call interpenetration. That's the usual name. I myself prefer to call it unilocality, I mean unified locality. Non non locality. When people call non locality, it means it's everywhere. It's not located here because it's everywhere. Unilocality is only one location, which is really not a location in time and space. Now, this is sort of esoteric uh, spiritual teaching, but it is the only thing I could find that sort of correspond to the quantum discovery of entanglement, which we saw is not only in space, but also on time. And the other thing, in the experience of moving toward this condition of property of consciousness, you feel, if I'm feeling it, like with my friend here, like she is, when I first was feeling it, 
It felt we were sitting in front of each other. It felt like there was a wormhole between us. Our hearts were connected with the wormhole. I said, Karen, what's this wormhole? It feels like a wormhole. It feels like some kind of a tunnel or something connecting us. And Morris said, well, that's curious. A wormhole, let's get into it. And as we felt, we felt when we got into the wormhole, we realized, oh, we got the same heart. A wormhole means there is no distance between our heart. Our, the center of our hair heart, our center of my heart became the same one. We had one heart. And we looked around, so everybody got the same heart. I don't really like everybody. Each point of time and space has in it all points of time and space. Now, the implication of this is immense. Implication for science might be immense if it is really related to entanglement. I'm not saying it explains entanglement. It's sort of similar to it on the spiritual level, and maybe it is related to it. Maybe some scientists will prove one day it's some kind of uh, equation or view that shows the, how the two are related. But this implication for experience is that if I am really interpenetrated with anybody, I can know the experience of anybody. People call that psychic experience. There is no psychic experience. Some people get into the wormhole once in a while. You could actually feel what's it like to be somebody. Not only, and spiritual teachers do it all the time. That's how they work with, teach, with their students. They feel their students. They know what their students are feeling. They know what their students are thinking. They know what it feels to be, in, to be in their skin. And that's how they could communicate to them. But the interesting thing for this uh, kind of unity is that it makes it possible for any one of us, if we have developed both this realization and the capacities of mind and consciousness, because it requires a quite different capacity, is that Right now, I can experience, for instance, the mind and the state of Nisargadha, the Maharaj. Because there's no time between us and no space. I can experience Nisargadha Maharaj the way he was before he died. But I also can experience him the way he is now, which is different than the way he died. I can also, I'm not saying I'm doing it, but I'm saying it's possible, and once in a while I do have that experience, you know. You can actually, because of this, if you really focus enough, if you know the, 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 how to orient your consciousness, you can, at this very moment, experience the mind of Einstein and see how he thought. You can experience the consciousness of Plato and see how he experienced it how he experienced things, how he thought. You can experience the mind and the consciousness of somebody in the future who nobody yet knows. You can experience yourself in the future. You can experience yourself before you die. You can experience yourself after you die. In principle, very rare that human beings develop their capacity to the extent that they can do that. Of course, the possibilities are myriad. I'm talking about experience, just inner experience. But the potential here is amazing, tremendous. Because if this is really, if we can realize this and really steep into it, that means I don't only can experience myself or experience, uh, let's say, Ramana Maharshi, I can actually physically go to Ramana Maharshi and talk to him. In principle, there is nothing against it. I, I am not able to do it yet. Maybe one day I will, you see. But so I'm saying, I'm talking about a kind of spiritual realization, a kind of experiencing of unity that is not the usual classical mystical experience of unity where unity 
is, means the unity of all time and space. You see, that all time and space is unity by the fact that there is no spatial distance between one form and another, and there is no time distance, no duration between one thing and another. So the potential of the human consciousness is amazing. That means you can experience everything and anything. You can experience the experience of anybody at any time. You can be them at any time. You can go meet them wherever they are, whatever time they are. It's potential for human beings. And maybe our science and maybe our spirituality will develop them. But it's important to say, to, to, for me to mention, I'm not taking this to mean that is what quantum entanglement is necessarily talking about. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Because the theory so far, does, as far as I know, does not predict that all particles are entangled. This spiritual understanding shows that all particles are interpenetrated. All points of time space are interpenetrated. All uh, forms that appear are interpenetrated or entangled in that way. And there are some theories, ideas, that maybe all of the universe is entangled, but I don't think it is known as an established theory, as far as I know. Maybe the spiritual understanding will reveal, well, maybe there's some truth to it. I don't know. I leave it to the, the enlightened physicists. We need physicists who can experience interpenetration and see if they could translate it into quantum mechanical terms. So, thank you for listening to me, and I'll leave the chair for the next one.